Tonight we begin our verse-by-verse study through the book of Job, and there's a lot that we could say in way of introduction to the book of Job, but I, I always like to just jump into the text and work through the introductory parts in the first several verses. So let's do that together. Uh, verses 1 through 5, Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. We have here in the first five verses of the book of Job, the setting of a stage. We're introduced to a man. We're given a geographical location that he's associated with. We're told something about his family. And what is especially emphasized to us is his godliness. So as we're introduced to the central character of this book of Job, we just should sort of pause for a moment and consider something about this book. What I just read to you is probably the oldest writing in the Bible. Now, there are definitely parts of the Bible that take place chronologically before this, right? Genesis 1.1. I mean, I'm not trying to suggest to anybody to you that, to any of you, that uh, Job was born before Adam and Eve. Of course not. But yet, we know that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those were all written by Moses. It's sort of a side issue, but I believe he wrote them on the basis of previously compiled accounts. And that's a whole other story that we can talk about at another time. But what I want to emphasize to you is that the book of Job predates the time of Moses by a long time. Now, one of the ways we know this is that the style and the vocabulary of the writing is very much an ancient, ancient form of Hebrew. As a matter of fact, There are some passages in the book of Job that when the translator comes to it, they just kind of guess. They don't exactly know. It's not that we don't know what the book of Job is talking about. The the essential meaning is clear enough. For example, in Job chapter 6, verse 6, Job complains. He says, is there any taste in the white of an egg? Now, the actual Hebrew word for white of an egg there, the translators are guessing at that. They really don't know if that's what it means. They think, well, maybe, kind of, sort of, makes some sense. Let's just say white of an egg. We don't know what the exact substance was that Job was talking about, but we get the point, right? This is what I'm trying to tell you, is what we are looking at tonight and in the following weeks is the oldest book in the Bible. The other thing we should understand about this book is that it is a poetic book. This is written in the form of poetry. Now, not so much the verses we just read. At the beginning part of the book of Job, it's what we would might call a historical narrative. It's telling a story. But once we get into the speeches that Job and his friends make back and forth to each other, and when the Lord speaks to Job, and when Job speaks back to the Lord, it is mostly presented to us in a poetic style. And you need to understand that about the Hebrew. When the Hebrew language... And I'm not talking about the modern Hebrew language. I'm talking about biblical Hebrew, the the, the ancient Hebrews. When the ancient Hebrews wrote in poetry, as we find in the Psalms, as we find in the book of Job and some other passages of scripture, when they wrote in poetry, it was not the rhyming of words. You know, that's how we sort of do poetry, right? We, we, We tend to do it with the rhyming of words and rhythm and cadence, you know, hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock, you know, on and on, that sort of thing, in the classical form of poetry. Hebrew poetry has a completely different approach. It doesn't rhyme sounds or rhythms, it rhymes ideas. And so you have an idea that's played off of and repeated and and presented in a different way, and it's more of a rhyming of ideas and thoughts than it is of 
words or sounds. Now the author, the date, even the place where Job took place are all uncertain. It, it may very well be that Job himself recorded his experiences in the book, or there may have been an another anonymous author. Again, judging by the style of the Hebrew that's used here, most scholars are in universal agreement that this is the oldest book of the Old Testament that we have right before us tonight. Now, the book of Job is not primarily about this one man Job's suffering and pain. What I want you to understand is Job's problem is not going to be so much financial or social or medical, even though he suffered in every one of those areas. The central problem that Job is going to have to deal with is theology. You see, Job must deal with the fact that in his life, God does not act the way that he thought he should. In this drama, the, the, the book of Job, it isn't like the record of the solutions and the explanations to Job's problem. No, it's more the revelation of Job's experience and the answers are carried on in within his experience. So what we have here are real events. This isn't make-believe. This isn't Hansel and Gretel. It's not Little Red Riding Hood. It's not some Disney movie. No, these are real events. But what you have to understand about these real events is that these real events teach us timeless lessons. I think there's something deeply profound in the idea that this masterpiece of literature from the Old Testament, the oldest book of the Old Testament, deals with at its core the problem of human suffering. Isn't that powerful? That this central idea of human suffering goes all the way back to the very earliest ideas of biblical uh, revelation. Well, what do we know about this man, Job? Go back to verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz. We don't know exactly where Uz was. Uh, some people believe that the best guess that people could make today is that it was somewhere in the area perhaps just north of modern-day Israel or in the northern part of modern-day Israel, you know, maybe in what would be today southern Syria. We just don't know for sure, but probably up in that general area. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. Now look at this line. It's very important. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. The first look we have at Job shows him to be an exceedingly righteous man. The author gives us here an impressive description of a man who's not perfect, but certainly he's complete in his devotion, respect, and obedience to God. I find it fascinating that Job's connection to God seems to be independent of any other Old Testament character, right? We don't have anything here of, of Abraham or Adam or Noah or anything else. He seems to be completely independent of any other Old Testament character. He, he sort of seems to, to have lived before the time of Moses and the people of Israel. Perhaps he even lived before the time of Abraham. We don't know for sure. The, the best guess would say that either he lived before the time of Abraham or there are some indications that maybe he lived in the generations following Abraham, maybe in the generation of Jacob and Esau. Now, we, we don't really know much more than that other than say that he's sort of like a character like Melchizedek, right? Who just sort of appears on the scene in the book of Genesis and independent of anybody else had his own relationship with the true God who reigned in heaven. And so you can debate a long time about the specific time that the book of Job takes place, but we don't exactly know when. What we do know is that this was a godly man. I want you to read that again right there in verse 1. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. The reason why I wanted to read it a third time to you is because if we don't understand that, we don't understand anything about the book of Job. You see, we have to save ourselves from the mistake of thinking that, that, that at some point, Job's sufferings, Job's experiences have for an explanation the idea that he caused them in some way. And what the writer of Job is taking great, great trouble to point out to us is that Job was blameless. Well, it doesn't mean that he was sinless, but blameless. There's a huge difference, right? Nobody could blame him of anything. Yes, he was a sinner before God and Job himself knew it. But nonetheless, no one could righteously blame Job of any sin. And I just want you to understand this. 
that, that we don't want to come to this and say, well, you know, we all know Job was a great sinner because, you know, we're all born sinners and we're, we're all depraved. And this is true. I mean, I'm not trying to deny the idea of original sin. But we cannot back off from what the scriptures tell us about Job. Everything that happened to Job in the following chapters, in this chapter that we're going to read tonight, it did not happen because he was a sinful man. The scriptures take pains to point that out to us. Matter of fact, quite the opposite. He was a blessed man. Did you see what it said? He had seven sons and three daughters were born to him, right? And in a culture where status and wealth might be measured by the size of a person's family, Job was a man with very impressive wealth and status. Not only that, he says he has possessions with 7,000 sheep and this many other livestock and all the camels and all the rest of it. By any measure, Job was a prominent and affluent man. His godliness, his wealth, his status made it true. Did you see that statement? That he was the greatest of all the people in the East at the end of verse 3. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? To take all the people. He was a celebrity. Everybody knew about Job. Everybody knew how godly he was. Everybody knew how blessed he was. Everybody knew how rich he was. This was an incredibly blessed, famous man. Put that in your mind about Job. Now, by the way, you say, well, Job was a rich man, you know. Well, what did he do with all that money? Later on, Job's going to tell you. You know, later on in the book of Job, Job kind of gives you a glimpse of what he did with his money. And you know what he did with his money and his time and his energy? He says that he rescued the needy. He cared personally for the handicapped and the dying. He brought orphans into his home. He even took the power barons of his day to court. And he argued the case for the underprivileged in the court of law. This was a godly man who cared about the little guy. Yes, he was rich, but he wasn't the kind of guy who jetted around on fancy jets and lived, you know, at Monaco and all the rest of it. No, no, no. He cared deeply about his fellow man. Now, this is what else we know about him. If you notice, starting in verse 4, it says, His sons would go and feast in their homes, each on his appointed day. The idea here tells us two things. First of all, the idea is probably the appointed day was probably their birthdays. And so these 10 children would get together on the birthday of whatever the 10, one of the 10 children was, and they would all get together at somebody's house and have a great big barbecue and, you know, dinner together. And they just have a great time. Do, do you get the impression here? What it's trying to tell you? That, that Job enjoyed a happy, healthy family. I don't know if any of you come from a family of 10 children. If you did, I'm going to make a guess that if you came from a family of 10 children, that not all 10 get along good with each other, right? I bet there's probably very few families that have 10 children in them that when the children all grow up, they're all great friends and buddies. I'm sure it happens some places, but you would have to say that that is a blessed man and that's a blessed family, isn't it? Well, this is how blessed Job was. His family, he would look at his kids. Oh, they're all getting together over at the oldest child's home. Oh, and they're having a great time. They love each other. Can you imagine the peace, the contentment, just, just the happiness in Job's life? He's a happy man. And then it says that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings. You see, the idea seems to be much more than just the idea that Job was a very careful, godly man who served as a priest to his family. It's more so that that, that 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 was the case. He's just this godly man who served as a priest to the family, much more than the idea that his children were wicked people who needed constant atonement. We don't get that flavor from the text at all. It's just like Job is very careful. He's very godly. And it's a beautiful example here. Here he is, you know, hey, maybe one of my children, without thinking, maybe they sinned, and, and I just want to cover it any way that I can. Now, as you stop right here at the end of verse 5 and, and read the description of this very, very blessed man, right? So far, you would have no idea that the book of Job is really about an epic war. That's what it's about. Yeah, it, it deals with this guy who lives this happy, blessed prosperous, godly life in the land of us. Great. We, we hear all about that. But after these first five verses, you wouldn't have a clue that it is really all about war. Now listen, in the book of Job, there's no city that's attacked. 
that there's no army that lays seeds to a city or is conquered, that there's no battles between men that are won or lost, there's no ocean sailed, there's no nations founded, that there's no adventures recorded. The whole conflict of Job takes place on an ash heap, a city dump right outside of Job's city. It's an epic war, but the war here in the book of Job is fought in the inner life. The book of Job is the war that is fought when a man or a woman tries to make sense of the deepest questions in life. And that's what Job's going to deal with. So we saw the earthly scene, right? In the first five verses, the camera pans back, right? Great big crane shot or with a helicopter, you know, pans back, you know. You see the happy home of Job, the children, they're all nice. Everything's great. Of course, they're all grown up. But the birds are singing, you know, the the, the pe- people are driving the cattle through the field. It's just a wonderful scene, right? And then the camera moves up to verse 6, up to where? Up to heaven. Look at it now, verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? I'll pause right there. Did you notice that it's the Lord who raises the whole question of Job, right? He introduces the whole thing. Anyway, going on. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and the possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold! All that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. It really begins innocently enough in verse 6, doesn't it? Now there was a day, right? You could build a very beautiful story around those words, right? Well, this wasn't a beautiful story. This introduces us to the scene in heaven. And might I remind you that though this scene that we read in verses 6 through 12, it's very vivid to us, right? We go, wow, can you believe this? This this sort of debating match between God and Satan, wow. I just want to remind you, Job was completely ignorant of it. Oh, you and I know it. Because the biblical text is showing us what lies behind that great curtain that separates heaven and earth. But Job was completely ignorant of this. And might I say this? I want to remind you of it. Even though it was unseen to Job and to other people on earth, it was absolutely real. Don't we all have the temptation to think that if we can't see something, it's probably not all that real? Don't we sometimes get this almost dreamy conception of heaven? That it's a place less real than this earth. You know, earth, well, this is real. This is real life, true life. Let me tell you something. If it's possible for us to think in these terms, heaven is even more real than earth. And it's absolutely real, even though Job and his friends were completely ignorant of it. And the story of Job can only be properly understood by taking into account what happened in heaven and having more than just this earthly perspective. I just want to take pains to tell you that the story of Job makes no sense to us apart from what we know in the heavenly scene, yet Job could not see that at all. And so what happened on that time? Well, there in verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. The phrase sons of God is used in the Old Testament to describe angelic beings. I believe you can find that in Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. You can also find it in Job chapter 38 verse 7. You see, among this group of angelic beings, and by the way, I'm using that phrase very carefully, angelic beings. I'm not saying angels. Because when I say the word angel, you usually think of a faithful angelic being, right? 
one who is on God's side, one who is a servant of God, and one whom God sends forth to be our servants and ministers. No, when I say angelic being, I'm encompassing both the faithful angelic beings, whom we often call angels, and the fallen angelic beings, whom we some call, sometimes call demons. So angelic beings encompasses both categories. You see, among this group of angelic beings, Satan also came among them. Now, I want you to notice something here. What does it tell us? If it says that Satan came among them, it indicates to us that Satan himself is an angelic being and that he is in no way equal to God. This is a critical error that many people make. Sometimes they make it in their theology. Sometimes they just make it in the way that they think and in the way they live their life. They consider Satan to be the opposite of God. Sometimes I've had fun with this. You know, I'll be speaking to a group of people and I'll say, okay, what's the opposite of hot? And they'll say, gold. What's the opposite of high? And they'll say, low. What's the opposite of day? And they'll say, night. And I'll say, what's the opposite of God? And invariably, some people in the audience will say, Satan. And it's not true, right? God has no opposite. By the way, if you wanted to answer the question correctly, what would you say? What's the opposite of Satan? We'd probably say Michael, the archangel, or some other high-ranking angel. But God has no opposite. So, so we should never inflate the status of Satan, lifting him up on a pedestal to make him think or to make our minds think that he is somehow an opposite of God. And they came to present themselves before the Lord. By the way, this is something that, that sort of stretches our mind a little bit. You know, I think I'm sure that I've said it at some times, you know, in my preaching through the years. I'm sure I've stood before a group of people in a Bible study, maybe a group very much like this, and, and I've told people, I've said, you know, God cannot tolerate any impurity, any unholiness in his presence, and that's why we have to be made right with God before we can go to heaven. And then I read this and say, well, Satan himself appeared before the Lord. Well, listen, it's not technically true that God cannot tolerate no unholiness in his presence. Now, certainly, God will not allow any unholy, unrighteous person to go into heaven. We know that. And believe me, Satan is here not as a, res a resident, only as a visitor, only under the pleasure of God. He he's checking in, so to speak. I don't know if this was his weekly report or his monthly report or whatever, but, but he, he is here at the bidding of God. But, but it's really theologically incorrect for us to say that for some reason, like as if God could just not, you know, allow any kind of unholiness in his presence, because he's certainly allowing Satan in his presence here right now. But of course, we know only as a visitor, not as a resident of heaven. And then God asks him. You saw that question there in verse 7. From where do you come? Now again, I want you to notice, God allowed and continued to allow Satan and fallen beings into his presence, but only for his own purposes. They had to report to God. And so God basically demands to know what Satan's business is. And Satan has to tell him. He says, listen, well, I've been going to and fro on the earth. By the way, wouldn't Satan say the same thing today? Doesn't First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 tell us that Satan is roaming across the earth? He's going to and fro across the earth. He roams about the earth as a roaring lion. We should understand this. Satan has an active interest in what happens on earth. He cares about what's happening on earth. And so he would say much the same thing today. If today Satan was cruising around up in heaven, making his, uh, what do we know, weekly, monthly, thousand-year report? I don't know. I don't have anything to say on that. But, but if he was making his report before God, God could ask him the same thing. What have you been doing? I've been going to and fro across the earth. And then God says, he opens up and, you know, you just got to know, if, if this conversation was ever revealed to Job at a later time, he would wince when he realized, God, why did you have to raise up my name here, right? Why bring me into it? But he did, of course, right? He said, have you considered my servant Job in verse 8? It was God who brought up Job as a subject for discussion. And God brought up Job in the sense of bragging about Job's godliness and character. God was so impressed with Job that he affirmed the description of Job that was first recorded in Job chapter 1, verse 1. I mean, look at it, verse 8. How would you like God to say this of you in heaven? 
uh, in verse 8, he says that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. That's, that's pretty high praise. Now, he said, have you considered my servant Job? That was a question for Satan. And what would be the answer to that? Well, of course I have. Of course I've considered Job. Of course I know who he is. Of course I've thought about him. Of course Satan considers the saints of God. Yet what does the devil see when he considers the saints of God? Well, first of all, we can see say that he sees the saints and he's amazed at the difference between himself and God's people. You see, he knows that though he has fallen, these earthen creatures can stand before God in his presence. Secondly, he sees them and he's amazed at how happy the saints are. He knows very well the misery of his own soul. You know the devil's a miserable creature. But he admires and he hates the peace that's in the heart of the believer. You know the peace that floods your soul when God comes and just brings that breath of the Spirit into your life and comforts you? Do you think the devil has ever experienced that since his fall? No way. When the devil considers the people of God, he sees them and he looks for some kind of fault, doesn't he? He, he wants to find some small comfort to comfort his own black soul in hypocrisy. That's one of the things why Satan loves to lead the people of God into sin. It's a comfort to him. And he sees them. And especially he sees the great hearts among the saints. And he sees those people who block and hinder his work. He looks at them with great frustration. And then he looks at the saints and he, he looks for opportunity to do them harm. But God says, listen, you know, Satan, you and I see the same thing. When we look at Job, we see him as a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Now, again, almost everything that we hear about Job in these first two chapters tells us something from God's perspective, right? You need to keep this deeply in mind as we continue our study through the book of Job because in the subsequent chapters, there's going to be all sorts of human opinion on how Job is and why he is and why he's in the condition he's in. You got to come back and always remember that this is God's perspective on who Job is. You see, later on, there's going to be this person saying that and another person saying the other thing and all these different people trying to tell you what kind of man Job is. I want you to know that issue is settled for us, isn't it? God settled it in the very first chapter. Now, again, we know and God knew that Job was not sinlessly perfect, but yet he called him blameless in the sense that there was no valid charge against him where all the charge, charges had been dropped. So, have you considered my servant Job, how godly he is? And then did you see the response of Satan there in verse 9, right? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? You know what Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 calls Satan? It gives him that title, the accuser of the brethren. You may know Satan personally in that capacity, right? the accuser of the brethren, and here Satan is fulfilling that role. He accused Job before God, insisting that Job's godliness was essentially false and that Job only served God for what he could get out of it. Now, let me tell you what, what, what Satan is right here. Satan's reply to God first reveals to us his essential cynicism. He doubts every supposed good as being dishonest or hollow. You know what cynicism is, right? You've heard the difference between an optimist and a pessimist, right? An optimist looks at a glass of water that's half filled with water, and the optimist says, well, it's half full. The pessimist says, well, it's half empty. The cynic says, it's poison. Now, that's basically the idea in cynicism. You look at everything, you go, oh, there's nothing good. Oh, I know that guy looks honest. I know he's good, but you know what? He's not good. He's just doing it for selfish or evil motives. 
And I would say, I'll quote here from a commentator named Anderson. He says, cynicism is the essence of the satanic. The Satan believes nothing to be genuinely good. Neither Job in his disinterested piety, nor God in his disinterested generosity. Because this is what I want you to understand. His accusation against Job was also an accusation against God, was it not? Job, you're not who you seem to be. You only love God because he bribes you. God gives you blessings. He bribes you with blessings, and that's the only reason why you love God. If the blessings were taken away, you you would no longer love God. But that's also an accusation against God, because it tells God, this is the only way you can get people to serve you. You don't have anybody who really loves you. They only serve you because of what you give them. You see, the accusation against Job was also an accusation against God. I want you to notice something else about the accusation that Satan made. Was it gave testimony to the fact that God had protected Job? Did you see that in verse 10? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? Listen, God, I've been trying to get a Job for years, but I can't. You've set a wall of protection around him. Actually, what's the phrase he uses? He uses a hedge of protection. Now, when I grew up in California, I knew what a hedge was. A hedge was just sort of a decorative plant. You know, I mean, it was just sort of for decoration. Maybe it would be between two pieces of property to say, well, this is one person's, uh, you know, front yard and this is the other person's front yard. A hedge wasn't anything scary. It was just a piece of decoration. But that's not what it was like in these ancient cultures. And I learned a little bit like this, not that it was one of these ancient cultures, but it reflects the same idea. When you go into, for example, um, England or Ireland, you start driving around through the streets and you go into with some of the country towns, the country places, and you, you're confronted with these things called hedgerows. You know what a hedgerow is? It's this wall of thick, thorny, brambling stuff that comes right up on the roadside. And there you are driving. It's bad enough trying to drive on the left side of the road. You're thinking all the time, left side, left side, left side. And trying to get used to shifting the shift lever with your left hand. And then all of a sudden, you're on this very, very narrow road. It's not big enough for two cars. And on the side of you is not some generous little shoulder, you know, where you could pull over, you have to, no, there's this huge hedgerow. It's like a wall of plant matter, vegetation, thick, thorny, grown in. It looks like it's been growing there for a thousand years, and it probably has been. And as you're driving along there, going around, you come around a corner, and there's a big tractor coming at you from the other end. I've had it many times, that experience. Well, that's the kind of idea behind this hedge. You see, in ancient Israel, they would grow a hedge around a valued piece of property, such as a vineyard. They would grow a hedge around it to protect it, to keep out foxes and pests or whatever sort of things that would come and just sort of get into the vineyard and mess it up. A hedge was a wall of protection. Satan says, I can't get to him because of this hedge you set around him. And now Satan says, look at verse 11. If you stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, he'll surely curse you to his face. Now listen, confident in his accusation against Job, Satan insisted to God that Job would curse God to his face if he withdrew his protection. God, you just let open that hedge. You give me a crack through that I can go and attack Job and take away some of what he has or all that he has. And I'll tell you, he's going to curse you to your face. Satan believed that adversity could make Job move from the standing in faith that he had. He believed that Job would be unable to stand against the wiles and the deceptions of the devil. You know, doesn't that remind you sort of the Ephesians chapter 6 scenario, right? Where we're called to stand against the attacks and the lies and the deceptions and the wiles of the devil. Well, this is exactly what Satan was trying to do against Job. And then what did God say in verse 12? So the Lord said to Satan, you can't lay a finger on Job because he's my special favorite and I'll never allow my favorites to undergo a trial. Well, that's what we wish he said in verse 12, right? It's sort of shocking, isn't it? Look at this. Verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, behold, All that he has is in your power. 
only do not lay a hand on his person. Now, in response to Satan's accusation, God gave Satan great power. It was limited power, but it was great power and permission to attack Job. God would let down the hedge. He wouldn't remove it. You see, Satan had the power and the desire to afflict Job all along. What did he lack? He lacked the opportunity before God. And so when God gave him the opportunity, Satan was more than happy to attack Job up to the limit of the allowance. By the way, shouldn't we just pause here and think of this? Have you thought lately about what Satan would do to you if God let him? Now, I know, maybe some of you here tonight, maybe you're undergoing a season of severe spiritual attack. And I don't mean to minimize that in your life at all. My, my heart goes out to you if this is a season of great spiritual attack to you. But I want you to notice, I want you to think upon this, that what you're going through is nothing compared to what you might be going through if God let Satan do whatever he wanted to to you. Oh, as bad as it is, Satan wishes it was a hundred times worse. Because even if God has let Satan have a little more latitude towards you, he hasn't unleashed him. I think of the picture of a dog on a leash, right? Here's a dog on a leash, right? And, and, and you think, well, God, you know, you're letting Satan get at me more than he has before. You, you must have let go of the leash. And God says, you know, I'll never let go of the leash. I may give it more line. I may give it more slack so that he could do more than he could do before. But God will never unleash Satan upon you. Notice this is what he says. He says, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on your person, on his person. You, you can do this, Satan, but you cannot do that. And God does the same thing in our lives today. You see, Satan was now able to attack Job in a much greater way than before, but his power was not unlimited. God was only going to allow Satan to do what God wanted him to do, ultimately to serve his own purposes. And so what happened? Look at it there at the end of verse 12. Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. He initiated a sequence of events in the spiritual realm that were real, but the spiritual aspect of them were not immediately apparent to Job. I want you to notice this. We look at this and we go, oh yeah, Ephesians 6, spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want you to notice, Job didn't experience it that way at all, right? All Job experienced was his life falling apart. And all this wonderful information that we're uh, introduced to in verses 6 through 12, Job didn't know it at all. Now, notice this here. Verse 13. Now, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raided them and took them away, indeed they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. But while he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, Another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and raided the camels and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young men and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Now again, this is what Job experienced. We understand the heavenly scene behind it, don't we? You see, we look at it from our knowledge, from our detached perspective. We say, Job, listen, what I want you to understand is that actually you're, you're sort of like the prize in a contest between God and Satan. And I know you can't understand it, Job, right? You're counseling Job right now, aren't you? You're saying, Job, 
There's a spiritual dynamic to your situation that you can't perceive. And God is actually using you to teach the angels a lesson. And you just have to stay faithful in the midst of this situation. You may not understand it at all, but believe me, from this spiritual perspective that you can't see, it makes perfect sense. Isn't that the counsel you'd give Job? So why don't we give that counsel to ourselves? You know, the idea that God uses his people to teach angels eternal lessons is totally reinforced to us by the New Testament. Are you aware of that? That Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 tells us that God is using the church to teach angelic beings about his wisdom. That is exactly what God is doing in the life of Job right here. Matter of fact, if you ever want to preach a sermon on Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, you got to use Job as an example. It's one of the most glorious examples of that verse. It's from the Old Testament. God is doing the same principle in the lives of his people today. And do you understand what that means? That means that there are things that you and I go through in this life that have absolutely no explanation other than the fact that God is teaching angels lessons through us. We, we face the same thing that Job faced, right? Job's going to torture himself for some 40 chapters following this. Why, 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 why? Now we know why, right? Because we read this. Would it satisfy Job if we could tell him and he would believe it? You know what, Job? I know this is really hard for you to take, really hard for you to understand. But God is using this to teach angels eternal lessons. And that is one of the main reasons. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the main reasons why he's doing this. You know, I would hope that Job would find great comfort in that. He'd say, well, at least it's not meaningless. Well, at least God knows what he's doing. Well, at least it's under the control. It's under the supervision of God. Do you understand what the book of Job teaches us? It teaches us that there is an aspect of human suffering and misery that is not necessarily the penalty for sin. It's not necessarily correction and righteousness. It's not redemptive in itself. And it's not even the noble bearing of persecution for righteousness sake. Job's suffering was of this peculiar aspect of suffering. We might say that the reason for his suffering was that he would be a tool that would teach angelic beings that God would make known his manifold wisdom to the principalities and power in heavenly places, as it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. And so God was going to use somebody in that. You say, well, he was going to use Job. Well, yes, he was going to use Job, but who else did he use? He used Satan. <laughs> right? D do you understand? That, that Satan is just serving God's purpose in all of this. Satan is actually going to serve the purpose of God in the book of Job. Absolutely and utterly. Think about it. At the end of it all, Satan intended to destroy Job and get him to curse God. I don't mean to spoil the story for anybody, but Job doesn't. And at the end of the story, Job is a more righteous man. He's a more blessed man. He's a more godly man at the end of the book of Job than even he was at the beginning of the book of Job. And, and if he could, and I don't think he should say it this way, I think you'll understand. I hope you'll give me the liberty to say this, right? You'll give me the liberty to say that if Job knew what was going on, and I think that perhaps God revealed it to him later. If Job knew what was going on, he would say, well, look, now I am a better man. I'm a more blessed man. I'm a more godly man. Thank you, God. and." Thank you, Satan. Can I even say that? No, I don't mean thank you, Satan, in the sense that, well, Satan should be thanked for it. But don't you see that in the end, Satan just served God's purpose? And he completely frustrated his own strategy. Well, all this calamity fell upon Job that we just read about in verses 13 through 19. 
Satan was given a greater allowance to afflict Job, and Satan maximized his work. Don't you find that interesting about Satan? God gave him more opportunity, and Satan made the absolute most of that opportunity. He said, okay, guys, let's research this. How can we maximize the impact upon Job? And they studied it. They took it to the research department. They ran a bunch of tests, and they said, the maximum impact on Job will not be by doing this in a drip, drip, drip basis. No, no, no. The maximum impact will come upon Job is if we do it all in one day. Satan says, great, let's do it all in one day. And so a succession of four attacks, right? In the span of a few hours, in that limited time, Job lost his oxen, his servants, his sheep, his camels, and worst of all, of course, his sons and his daughters. And this catastrophe came upon his sons and his daughters as they were feasting in the older brother's house, right? As they were enjoying themselves as a family, as they were having this good family relationship that Job was so blessed with. Can you blame Job for thinking, for at least having the thought in his mind, why do I have such a blessing? If they didn't get along, they wouldn't all be together in that house. But it's because they loved each other so much that they were all gathered together in that unfortunate house. Could you blame Job for feeling that his blessings had not only been taken away, but turned back upon him almost? So his blessings themselves became a curse. And so what happened? The Sabaeans came, right? And then it says that the fire of God fell from heaven, right? And then the Chaldeans came. And then it says a great wind came. These tragedies came to Job from many different causes. Yet we know that there was one prior cause behind them all, and that was Satan. And by the way, from this all, we learn a little something about how Satan works, right? Did you notice what it said there in verse 15? When the Sabaeans raided them and killed them and took them all away. And then later on, it speaks in verse 17 about the Chaldeans who formed three bands and came. When the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans came, prompted by Satan to do this against Job, how did Satan do that? Were the Sabaeans there thinking, oh, we love our brother Job? And how can we bless Job? And then suddenly Satan came against them and put an evil desire that they never had before in their hearts. And they twisted their good, innocent hearts into something evil. No! Satan just had to give opportunity for the Sabaeans to do the wicked that they wanted to do all along. Satan doesn't have to force anybody to do wicked. Doesn't have to force anybody to do evil. Just gives him the opportunity and points him in the right direction. He accomplished his evil purpose by working through the evil character of fallen man. By the way, I have to raise this. And and to be honest, this makes me a little bit uncomfortable to raise this. I'm throwing this out as a question, and I I can't answer it before you. Let me just say this right here. I'm just throwing it out, but I have to be honest with the text. What I read right here in Job chapter 1, in my mind, it gives more power to Satan than I thought he had. Apparently, Satan had some influence over the weather, right? A great wind. Apparently, Satan could imitate a phenomenon that's usually associated with the Lord, right? The fire of God fell from heaven. Now, no, we, of course, we know it wasn't the fire of God, but that's what the people thought. That's what they saw. They figured it was the fire of God. The servants of Job thought that God sent this fire. That was true only, of course, in a very indirect sense. By the way, it also shows us that Satan will often work in a way so that his work can be blamed upon God, right? They didn't say the fire of Satan fell from heaven. They said that the fire of God. I got to say, this this is kind of disturbing to me, right? I just have to be honest with you. And so we see that sometimes God allows Satan to have more power than we might normally think he would have. But we also see that this attack was clearly focused against Job. But, and this is another very uncomfortable thing that I have to raise with you. The attack was focused against Job, but other people suffered as well, right? Job's servants died. Of course, Job's children died. Satan attacked Job, and God allowed him to be attacked, but Job's animals, servants, and children all perished because Job was the target. Now, i got to be honest. I think about God. How do you justify that? Oh, I can see afflicting Job, right? If he's the battleground, then fine. Do the battle around him. But God's telling him, no, I want you to know something here. 
that these other people were involved as well. How could God vindicate this? Well, let me suggest a couple things. First of all, in allowing their lives to be ended, right? Job's children and his servants. God did not allow these people to pass from an immortal state into a mortal state. In other words, it's not as if Job's children were going to live forever and then all of a sudden they died. I don't mean to sound too fatalistic about this, but let me be very straightforward with you. Every child that comes out of the womb is born to die. Now, now we may object to the timing of someone's death. But their death is inevitable. Unless Jesus Christ comes for his church first, I'm going to die. And the timing of it is purely in God's hand. N nobody should be upset for a moment that I would die. Because I was born to die. The timing of it is in God's hands. The only surprise in their death was that they died sooner than was expected, not that they died at all. Secondly, the rightness or wrongness of what God either allows or actively does can only be finally judged by the measure of eternity, right? We can't figure it all out on this earth. At the end of it all, we can only say that God either did right or wrong, be these unfortunate children of Job or these unfortunate servants of Job, by the eternal picture. And until we know the eternal picture, we just trust what Abraham knew of God when he said this, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? But here we leave ourselves at the end of verse 19. And I think we'll leave it there for this evening and pick it up at verse 20 when we come together next time. With this incredible calamity that Job has gone under. Now, here's the thing I want to conclude with. Job experienced all of this. It was like a waterfall of disaster upon him, right? It was like a Niagara Falls of disaster coming down upon Job. You and I, because it's revealed to us in the scriptures, we know what was happening behind the curtain, right? Job didn't know. So doesn't it make sense for you to think there can be happening things behind the curtain in my life that I don't know about? Now, I don't say that to try to tell you to figure out what's happening behind the curtain, right? Because I don't think you or I can. I don't think God calls us to know what's happening behind the curtain in heaven, right? But what he does tell us to do is to recognize that it is happening and that God has a good and just reason that he may not explain to us. Perhaps the best way to understand this is just the analogy of a parent with a child, right? Doesn't the parent do this all the time with the child? Mommy, daddy, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to? Mommy, I don't like it when you take me to that man's office. He sticks something in my arm and it hurts really bad and I have to cry. Now, listen, that's got to be like the worst day in that child's life, right? It certainly feels like it to that child. Why would my parent ever do this to me? Why? Now, listen, that child can't actually understand what's behind the curtain but they should be able to trust mommy or daddy to know that there is something behind the curtain that is good and that is right. So you think about it. There is a spiritual background to your life right now. I find it fascinating that Satan is interested in not only great men on the earth like Job, but in people like me and you. And there's a spiritual background to our lives right now. Not that we're here to figure it out, but we're here to appreciate it and to trust God in the midst of it. Next week, we'll get together and start looking through in this amazing response that Job gives starting at verse 20. But let's end it here for now and let's, let's conclude in prayer. Father, we, we think about this and we don't want to take it lightly, Lord. We don't want to think about this whole waterfall of calamity that fell upon Job in this one day. 
and just sort of pass it off lightly, Lord, that this man's life was forever altered in the span of a few hours and one afternoon. And yet, Lord, we recognize that you know what is right. We agree with Abraham that the judge of the earth will do right, and we believe it. So, Father, right here tonight, I suppose we just ask for the ability to trust you, the ability to really express our confidence in you, that whatever you do behind that curtain that separates earth and heaven, Lord, you know what you're doing. We take great peace in that. Thank you, Lord, for being our advocate in heaven against the accuser of the brethren. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.